our next panelist already. So, I mean, I'm kind of here also to introduce Joe, so you're about to take a seat, but if there was anyone that could have introduced himself, it would have been him. <laughs> <laughs> but next up, we have Not Your uh, Keys, Not Your Coin, and we have, if you give a warm welcome, please, to Obi and Mark and Shimon and Joe. And Adam. <laughs> Welcome, Adam. Hello. You, you said, um, is this the comfier one? Ready? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, go for it. And Shimon from OKX. Hello, Shimon. Where do you feel more comfortable? And Obi, who I'm wondering how low your voice is going to be today, Obi. How, what, you know, where are we on the Obi scale? <laughs> <laughs> Come on down. Welcome. <laughs> so, are you seeing me? What? Uh, <laughs> All right, what I love about this panel before we kick off is that we have an exchange. We have, uh, well, someone that used to run an exchange and now runs Filament, which is, um, I'm going to allow you to explain it later, Obi, because I still don't quite understand it. Um, but basically, there, are, there is some sort of um, keys sharing going on. And then, yeah. of course, we have Adam Back, who's the CEO of Blockstream and uh, presumably a proponent for looking after your own keys. Um, would you like to disagree with what I've just said there first, or are we okay with those as an introductory? Yeah. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're happy with it. Okay. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty, can we establish what is a key? Why is this panel called Not Your Keys, Not Your Coins? I don't know. Um, well, I think unlike other forms of online money, you know, like Venmo, PayPal, um, where if you mess up, like you lose your password or your online banking authentication, you can provide some identity and they'll replace it. In Bitcoin, because it's bearer, there is nobody to rescue you when you mess up. And so, you know, the thing that you have control of your money with is the key. Mm -hmm. And if you lose the key, the money is gone and there's no going back. Mm -hmm. And so, the challenge with letting other people manage your keys, and there are services in Bitcoin that do have other people managing your keys, like custodians that, that charge you to manage their keys, or exchanges that hold the keys to your coins so that you can trade them. And of course, the risk with having other people manage your keys is now you're really back in the bank situation, where if you get into some kind of legal dispute, a court could provide an order to an exchange or a custodian and say, don't give him his money back, mm -hmm. freeze it. Mm -hmm. And so, point of Bitcoin to be sort of bare and permissionless, if you want to be unfreezable, you've got to hold it yourself. The downside, of course, if you lose the keys, you know, you just dropped some 50 pound notes on the street and you're not getting them back, right? Mm. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely not financial advice there. Okay, um, Shimon, we, we were talking yesterday and you mentioned that you're a cypherpunk and you're a you know, firm believer in the Bitcoin mission, and yet you also work for an exchange. How, how do you deal with these sort of two ideas, you know, on, on a day to day basis? Yeah, I mean, for me, I you know wake up every morning and I'm thinking, what can I do to increase adoption of um, of Bitcoin? And so, I think both fiat on and off ramps, and also the all the education and everything else that an exchange provides, it's it's really contributing to a space. But I really believe that the most important thing that people don't understand is that they have to hold their keys in order for Bitcoin to even work the way we want it to work. Because, for example, the problem with gold was that when you get a gold bar, it's very expensive for you to know if it's real gold inside. You have to melt it and all of that. And so then you give it to a custodian that gives you a note and says, this is a serial number of a gold bar, right? And uh, it, we assayed it, it's all good. And then you start trading this note. From that moment on, you lost control. You don't know if they switched your gold bar or if like, when you ask for it to be delivered to you, they will deliver a real one to you, but like, they have a bunch of fake ones. So it's the same with Bitcoin. I think when people hold their keys, it prevents you know, any actor, not even the exchange. It can be governments. It can be any actor of uh, you know, manipulating the quantity. And so I'm actually worried that if, if too many people leave their Bitcoin in centralized places, it kind of prevents the whole network from working the way it should. Mm. So, so in effect, and I'm going to be a little bit devil's advocate here, in buying Bitcoin from, say, an exchange like OKX, and not withdrawing from the exchange, then you have a similar situation to the gold previously. I mean, does that not mean that the onus is on the exchanges to encourage people to take, their, take custody of their keys? 
I mean, it's not about encouraging. There's a trade-off, right? So like mm -hmm. some people are not comfortable having the responsibility of holding their keys, mm -hmm. uh, but we definitely should explain to people the advantages of, of being able to do that. So I think the, 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 in everything there's, there's trade-offs, right? Otherwise the other solution wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we're definitely pro people, you know, holding their own keys for sure. Okay. Does that chime with your experience, Obi? You know, you, you ran an exchange for eight years. What, 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 yeah. what were the actual stats yeah. like? How many people did hold their keys? Um, so I, I set up an exchange in 2013 in the UK, and it went on to be the longest running exchange in the UK. And when I set it up, I saw myself as this sort of Zorro-like character, if that's the right <laughs> term. I would watch uh, that. With the light right. over my head, it might sort of <laughs> make a, a sort of quasi mask. Um, <laughs> who was um, effectively trying to free people from this sort of fiat prison yeah. in, and, and get them into this promised land of Bitcoin or yeah. freedom, freedom finance. And, um, and so I saw myself as this jailbreaker. And then over eight years of increasing regulation, I realized I was being slowly transformed into this jail keeper. Oh. Um, effectively. Um, we tried very, very hard to get people to self-custody. So it wasn't just give you a choice, but um, we, we had this extra, education extra, edu section, and we called it the No BS Bitcoin Education section. Um, and we spent a lot of time on explaining to people how to self-custody, literally in some cases begging people to try to self-custody. Right. Um, and at the end of that period, we still had single-digit percentages um, or self-custodying. In fact, when we started, we started in the wake of, of um, Mt. Gox, which was this very large, for, um, very large Bitcoin exchange at the time, um, the largest in the world, where many people custodied, and it famously uh, imploded. Um, a lot of people lost access to their Bitcoin because mm -hmm. they weren't holding their own keys. So we started in an environment where people were very, very uncomfortable with exchanges. Um, and so the level of self-custody was much higher. People would put buy and then immediately withdraw because they were worried that amount of goals oh, wow. would happen. But slowly over time, because people become comfortable with human nature, and they, be, they became more, um, and also because exchanges became easier to use and so on and so forth, they became more reliant on exchanges. And that, um, as regulation was increasing, people's reliance on exchanges was also increasing. Uh, ultimately, that led me, um, one of the big reasons why I sold my exchange and um, focused on trying to find other ways to get people at least off exchanges or having, them, having a viable option. Now, let's be clear. For some people, it may make sense to use an exchange, mm -hmm. but, um, I think it's important to have a viable option which is as good as an exchange, um, but with the killer app of being more privacy preserving. Mm -hmm. Because at scale, we don't want a world of, um, people talk about CBDCs and mm. governments being able to see everything that you have, but mm. if exchanges tend to be highly centralizing, liquidity begets liquidity. So if we have 8 billion users all using Bitcoin and 95% of them are exchanges, it'll probably be 10 or so exchanges. So that would be 10 companies, each with a billion users, full yeah. details, which would be just as bad as a CBDC. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's get um, some audience participation here. Can I see a show of hands if, if you've used an exchange? Just hands up if you've used an exchange? Okay, and then, uh, no, leave your hand up, leave your hand up, sorry. Right. Um, can you put your hand down if you've taken custody of that Bitcoin or crypto from exchange? Mm. Wow, okay, we're really preaching to the, the choir here. Yep. These guys understand, there was a few there. For those guys that haven't taken your Bitcoin or crypto off exchange, what would you say to them? Well, I mean, I would say, I, oh, you want the... Well, I, I was yeah. kind of looking at both of you, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, so what, what uh, was the Wait, For those that have um, Bitcoin or crypto on exchanges, what would you say to them? Because I, I, I thought your wording was interesting there, you say, you can't encourage people to take custody, but you can sort of show the advantages and disadvantages? Well, I mean, again, I think it's really important to, uh, for me, for a philosophical reason, for people to educate themselves enough mm -hmm. so they have the comfort level of taking mm -hmm. their own keys, okay. right? So this is the most important thing. I think if, if people just do it for, uh, you know, reasons of, of um, 
it, it's, it's really important. It's like if, if not enough people do this, I think the whole Bitcoin system could be compromised at some point. Mm. And so, but, but you can't force someone, you can't say, immediately take your you know, Bitcoin off exchange because like, yeah, my, my mother, for example, she's not comfortable with like handling a, a seed phrase, right? Yeah. So, uh, so again, how to educate it, yeah, yourself enough mm -hmm. to be comfortable enough. Uh, there's many, you know, multi-sig, there's different ways of storing your keys. Uh, we don't have to get into it, but uh, there's really many different solutions you know and uh, the Bitcoin billionaires is probably uh, the, it described the most elaborate way of like you know doing a multi-sig and putting it in vaults in different banks across the country and you know destroying the computer that generated it so that's like one extreme so the, the other extreme the Winklevoss is, solution right exactly yeah, okay. <laughs> so yeah. the other solution is just leave it on exchange and don't worry about it so yeah. in the middle right you have many different uh, solutions but yeah please educate yourself and and what's important for me uh, is for people to understand that it's not going to work if it's just like a centralized, okay. uh, you know, to OB's point. If, if and, everybody uh, uses three exchanges, it's going to be trivial to take it yeah. over. And, and I would say, one, first of all, I, I completely understand why most people made that decision today. Um, although we all, I, I think most people understand um, now that the, the gold standard or the Bitcoin standard is mm -hmm. to self-custody. Um, but... Um, Again, after many years of trying, um, I always remember there was a, a member of, of our exchange because we would I would try to sometimes just talk to normal members of the of the uh, of the of the exchange um, and get to understand why they do what they do. Um, and she was really switched on. She was you know older than me, I'll say in in, uh, in terms of age, but a streetwise smart woman. Um, and after months of asking her and seeing if we could get her to self-custody, she said, look, Obi, I completely get this Bitcoin thing. I completely understand why it's important. And I completely understand why it's just self-custody. But the, tr the reality is I trust you more than I trust myself. Oh, right. <laughs> and, when, and when she said that, that made me really think. Um, and especially, again, you know, I, I'm very focused on the global self. There are um, other reasons why people find it difficult to self-custody, yeah. but when we analyze it, it comes up to three things. One, uh, for a lot of people, the, to do it properly is yeah. too expensive for them. Yeah. Um, for, uh, or there's logistical issues around receiving it and so on and so forth. For a lot of people, even, and it's getting better, but it's still too complex for their comfort level mm -hmm. um, to handle. And then for a lot of people, through years of of learned um, understanding of how the world works and, and how to, where to attribute trust, um, people just feel scared. They yeah. just feel scared to, to take on that responsibility. Mm. So those are the three, three reasons. And so um, the answer is you have to provide a solution which is technically easier, mm. lower cost, and, and provides less fear mm. than the existing option Otherwise, people won't move. You should, there are many other reasons why it's for privacy and so on, but that's not the reason why people will move. Um, the the, the um, technology that we and I and, and Blockstream and many others have been supporting through open source, which is Fedimint, um, is an attempt to create effectively a way where communities can work together to have each other's back mm -hmm. and, and make their own effectively mini um, custody solution for themselves. Interesting. The idea being that one, your cost is then amortized or shared across the community, making it lower cost than using exchange. Technically, the, the, um, the, the technically strongest in the community do the heavy lifting on behalf of the rest of the community. So okay. for the majority of people, it's technically simpler. And finally, um, in terms of fear, you're, you, have, you now have a choice of trusting people who've had a uh, a group of people who have a long-standing history of acting in the interests of your community and with integrity versus trusting a custodian um, who you don't know, mm -hmm. who's well capitalized, but at least that gives you another choice, which many people have, may decide is, is a better from a trust trade-off. It's not as good as self-custody, let's be clear. Yeah, but at least it's a, it's, it's a viable option. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just uh, sorry, I'll come to you in a second. I just wanted to double check: was that conversation with that lady the was that the, the starting point of Fediment? Was that when the, no, like the spark sort I mean, of? No. Fe well, 
Fedimint, I, I came fed into Fedimint late, just to be clear. Oh, okay. okay. Um, Fedimint was um, an idea created by um, my um, co-founder, uh, Eric Syrian. Okay. And even then, he, was, he came up with that idea in um, a number of hackers' congresses um, a, a few years ago, oh, okay. working with other um, cypherpunks and cryptographers. Okay. I was looking um, for a, and, a spark. Uh, but there's a whole history yeah. to Fediment, um, and yeah. it starts with roots back from 1983, with Chalman, Lee Kirsch, and David yeah. Chalman, and, and it goes on to okay. from there. Okay, red herring. Um, sorry, Adam. Um, yeah, so, I th you know, uh, the, the data is interesting about how many people leave coins on exchange, and I think there are two types of uh, reasons that people leave coins on exchange. One is... You know, they've, they've built a crypto position and they're not very actively trading and they just leave it there because they don't, you know, they're worried about failing a backup if they do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And they trust that the exchange um, has a lot more professional staff and securable offices and all this kind of thing and they're going to keep the coins because, you know, there's the risk the exchange goes bankrupt or gets a court order to seize your funds. Um, and the other reason is for active traders, they are, you know, placing limit orders and so they've got to leave money on exchange to do that or they're using leverage and this kind of thing. And so for that particular situation, there is a potential solution. And so with Blockstream, we have the, the Liquid Network, which is a layer two for trading, and there are um, trustless limit orders. So it's basically a way for you to, you know, use an exchange or an exchange-like interface and see an order book and say, yeah, I want to put a limit order, I'll buy Bitcoin if it falls to 18,000. And then it, you know, it asks you to scan a QR code and then your wallet says, okay, sign this. And what you've signed is you haven't transferred the coins, you've transferred like a mini smart contract that says that anybody can take this coin, this one Bitcoin, if they send, uh, you know, my wallet the, the dollars. And so, you end up with an exchange that is not custodial. And so there are apps like this. One is uh, Sideswap, another is TDEX. And some of them have web interfaces, some of them are like desktop apps. But basically you get you know, some forms of trade without giving up custody. You've still got to manage the private keys, but for the segment of users who leave things on exchange because they're active traders, they can do that. And arguably, you might get uh, more market depth, like more orders on the order book, yeah. Because for any trader who's you know been trading for a while, they've usually have a loss story. They lost some coins in Mt. Gox, they lost them in BTCE, they lost them in Quadrigo. There's so many exchange hacks, and so they've learned to be cautious, right? So so they'll say, well, this trade is worth it, so I'll leave the coins there. But this one is a low probability trade, so I won't even bother, right? Because it wasn't worth the custody risk. So if you get rid of the custody risk, they'll put like silly low bids, and that'll actually prevent flash crashes and improve the market. Oh, it's, uh, like, because, it's like buying a dip on steroids. Yeah, because I mean, today, you know, you, the, the, flash, the flash crashes happen because there's not enough liquidity on the exchange. Mm. And so you're waiting until people rush to put money on there to buy it, right? And if they can leave the orders there all the time, it simply won't happen, right? Because the, the interest to buy at those levels is automatically there. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the other thing, is, which is more about the sort of usability and safety net. So one of the reasons people don't do their own storage is they're worried about losing the keys. Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, high assurance IT backup is a scary thing. Even professionals screw it up. Mm -hmm. You know, companies have lost keys and, and stuff like that and, and master passwords. And so another direction is to try and get the safety net of a company that can, you know, take information from you and recover your coins and your own keys at the same time, and a way to square that is with time locks. Mm -hmm. So the Blockstream Green Wallet has, it doesn't have that feature, but it has some time lock features that can be extended to this kind of thing. And basically the idea is that, you know, for let's say six months, as long as you are, you're, al you know, you're keeping it alive, you're transacting once in a while, you're showing evidence you still control the key, it, it remains only you that can spend it. Mm -hmm. But if you go completely inactive and don't transact for six months, um, a time lock kicks in, and then the the service provider, like security provider, could spend the coins, and you know then they provide a recovery service, and maybe they charge you a fee for it. So I think that kind of assurance, like well, if you really mess up and you lose everything, like you lose the phone, you lose the keys, you lose the computer, you have a boating accident, <laughs> you can actually get the funds back. And there are lots of uh, coins that have been lost. 
through that. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, one of the questions yesterday was, you know, up to as much as 20% of the coins in existence right now have been lost. Um, th just to go back to these trustless limit orders, this is going to sound like a stupid question, and maybe it is, but um, trusted market buy orders wouldn't make sense because you might as well just send the, the coin straight to the cold well, storage no, by mean, yourself. I think a market buy works too because an exchange market buy is not instantaneous, right? So you're going to, you know, deposit a wire transfer or deposit some stable coin like Tether or something. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to click buy, and then you're going to withdraw. And you know that that might take a day if you you know you send a wire transfer and you're waiting for the notification and you're busy. And if you were like super unlucky, the exchange gets hacked or mm. goes bankrupt at that during that time window, and now you're in the same situation, right? So the you know the limit orders. There's always a maker and a taker. So the the maker is the person that's placing limit order. The taker is the person that says, I'll take that. I'll okay. sell at that price. I'll buy at the price. So that can happen in the same way. So they're yeah. they're both like you know. I've got some tether in my wallet. I want a Bitcoin. You have a limit order. I'll click yes, and you know there'll be a, a swap in my wallet. So yeah. wallet to wallet, I will get you know tether, and you'll get the Bitcoin. That's very clever. Okay. Um, I mean, Shimon, I'm kind of asking you this as if you're the voice of all the exchanges in the world. But is this on your radar, and is this the sort of thing that exchanges will eventually be implementing naturally anyway? I mean, I think they should. Uh, it's definitely on the radar. I mean, we're looking, uh, you know, before this, I was at a more institutional conference in London, and I heard a gazillion different ways to do this shared custody and different, different mm -hmm. ways to move things around between exchanges. It's both centralized, uh, you know, Blockstream. I love the, uh, that um, solution, too. So basically, there's so many solutions. But I'm sure at the end of the day, uh, one company that pitched to me, they basically said, look, leaving funds on exchanges is basically a high cost of capital. Like, you can't do other things with those funds. So I'm sure mm -hmm. that the market will find uh, the best possible solution. And I also think, uh, you know, when you, get, when you choose the exchange, it's really important to, to, to look at, like, the, you know, the jurisdictions <coughs> and, and all of that because... You know, I'm, for example, I'm very bullish on the U.S. I live in the U.S., and I think property rights are very, very strong in the U.S., and you can see that that's what was the engine of growth for the economy, right? Mm -hmm. So you can basically say, okay, if I'm worried, uh, you know, there's different jurisdictions where I can choose to, to leave my things, even if I want to, like, you know, wait to place a limit order or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but I think what's cool about Bitcoin is that the movement between jurisdictions is super easy. And, and that's like the, the real breakthrough versus gold, right? And gold, they could just say, you cannot take this through an airport or you cannot, or, oh, you want to get delivery? Okay, there's a 20% tax or something. You know, mm -hmm. like jurisdictions can change. Versus with Bitcoin, you can see the, you know, some changes and before they happen, you can withdraw put it in another place. Okay. Were you a gold bug before Bitcoin? No, I actually was not. I, okay. I found out about gold only after investing in Bitcoin, because I never understood what, what was the deal with gold. Like, uh. <laughs> could, I, could I just interject to explain something about the exchange ecosystem and that it's much worse than people think it is? So oh, yes, please. There are, there are uh, <laughs> big exchanges and there are smaller exchanges, and even some of the bigger exchanges started doing this, so it's kind of... The original exchanges did everything. They custodied the coins for the clients, they operated the exchange platform, they did the KYC, and nowadays it's kind of specialized. So there are separate KYC companies that provide you know, scanning passports as a service. Um, but the custody has also specialized. So there are now companies that mm. basically custody the coins for the exchange. So you might think, oh, well, I trust this exchange operators, but they don't have the coins. Mm. They outsourced it all to another company, and that company is uh, outsourcing exchange custody for like dozens of exchanges. So if that company gets hacked, a lot of people are going to get an unhappy surprise, right? And you know, examples of those kind of things are uh, BitGo is a, is a big service that sort of provides securities as a service to exchanges. And they're also the custodian of um, a so-called wrapped Bitcoin on other chains. Yep. And so you know, effectively, they're custodian of an enormous amount of Bitcoin indirectly. Mm -hmm. And um, other examples are f Fireblocks, and there are some competitors to those. So they're basically service providers that, as a user, you never see because they provide service to exchanges. But collectively, they have some huge proportion of Bitcoin that are on exchanges. I don't know if it's like 50% of Bitcoin on exchanges are actually in some way managed by those kind of things. And mm -hmm. of course, part of the reason is, you know, the exchanges are like, well, security is scary. Let's find somebody to like pass the problem to. But the problem never goes away, right? Just get mm -hmm. concentrated in one place. And like some of these firms have had their own security hacks and problems historically. Yeah. So it's not like they don't have a, a, a you know, security problem. History, and if, if a big one of those recurs, it's now 
you know, a much bigger event because they have multiple companies' coins. Well, yeah, yeah we've seen numerous examples of that, right? The Casa just had their data leaked. It was obviously the famous Ledger hack two, two years ago now. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, the, I was going to make the same point because uh. um, I was seeing it. We were constantly being serenaded when we were running exchanges to find ways to solve or answer um, traders' um, um, calls for better liquidity, quicker movement of money between exchanges, uh. um, not having to rely on us. And generally, if you leave it to <coughs> market forces, uh, the solutions that come up, you tend to come up with are the ones that tend to lead to more centralization. So, Interesting. And now, but if you think about that, what you're effectively doing is uh, if you, in traditional finance and in traditional exchanges, uh, they are um, often mandated by regulation to not hold their own um, keys effectively, not hold their own fiat, but provide it, uh, use different services such as clearing houses and so on to handle the, the storage and transfer of this, this value. Mm -hmm. And these people and these organizations are effectively slowly transforming into effectively being the clearing houses for these mm -hmm. exchanges, ever more centralized. Yeah. Okay. And so it's basically replicating the existing system, right? Yeah. So it's reversion to mean, so like Fiat there was a problem, yeah. Bitcoin fixed it, <laughs> and it's, it's morphing back into the original problem. And you have to put work really hard to think, we have to think harder. We have to try harder. There is a way to have our Bitcoin cake and eat it too, you know, our decentralization cake. Well, like and, that. and we just have to keep finding those ways mm -hmm. and pushing that way. Okay. I mean, I actually think that I, I would disagree with the market forces thing. I hope that mark, I mean, I, I believe that market forces can lead to a decentralized solution that's actually better than a centralized solution. And there's many examples, like even in history, like I read a fascinating uh, blog post that said basically the reason why Europe became very successful is because it was kind of decentralized. They had many kingdoms and they had to kind of figure out how to work together and versus like other empires that were very centralized and then you're kind of worried of a revolt. And so the whole government structure is different. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that that's the point of Bitcoin, where, where centralized solutions, I mean, th the reason why I, I became kind of more, um, you know, anarchist and stuff like that is like I understood, even if the, let's say the government has the best of intentions, right? You don't know if the next government will have the same intentions. So anytime you have a centralized source of power, it becomes like a honeypot for whoever, you know, gains power mm. in different ways. So I really think that uh, we'll see what happens. Now the world, for example, this stuff that's happening this year, I don't think anybody would have predicted, like, you know, the, the geopolitical stuff that we're seeing. Like two years ago, it sounded like ludicrous. Mm. So I think that the more the centralized system becomes under stress, and, you know, we, we heard a great talk with uh, Greg Foss and, and Larry yesterday, which is like, you know, things are going to be kind of shaky in the global economy. So mm -hmm. I think any centralized form of storing wealth, uh, that will be the first thing they go after uh, mm -hmm. when, once the system starts to break. So I really hope that market forces, uh, you know, yeah, there's a lot of education needed. That's why I'm, I'm a big believer in education, uh, just like how do we educate everybody about the, the importance of, you know, being I, I, I agree. It, it is, um, um, but I guess there's, two forces, forces from within the system and forces from without. Forces Please. from without want to push against that and they will gain strength and they will provide education to find ways to leave the system. But if you're within the system, it tends to want to maintain yeah. its results. I always like to say, turkeys don't vote for Christmas. And the same is true <laughs> here. Um, and that's one of the reasons why ultimately I decided to and it started that the seeds of me deciding to leave was when the FATF travel rule was approved in 2019 and knowing that it takes three to six years roughly for these things to be implemented. I knew the clock started ticking then and that's when I started looking at ways to get people off exchanges and get myself out of that world. Um, the day I so, um, stepped down as director of my company and had sold the company, the same day I was announced as a board member for B-Trust, the Jack Dorsey Jay-Z, um, um, initiative, and uh, it was an incredible weight off my shoulders because I can now speak my mind, yeah. and I can now work on on actually being part of well, in my mind, and I, 
I, being part of what I believe was the solution as opposed to reinforcing the existing system. So, Pat, did you, have, so you, make a can you make a final comment as we, we've been uh, going okay, to wrap this up, unfortunately? A couple points. So one oh, is that, um, you know, buying from exchanges, you know, people need on-ramps and off-ramps, and so it's, it's part of the adoption story. If you can't buy Bitcoin from platform, it's harder because you have to find a friend of a friend who can send you some for cash. But mm -hmm. there is something to be said for having Bitcoins that are not linked to your name. Because you know, if you think about Bitcoin as an insurance policy, and you look at you know, like a country like Ukraine or somebody's getting through political strife, they basically go and mine. Like if if a country gets taken over politically, the invaders go and mine the public registers, the financial registers, and go and seize assets. And you know, if Bitcoin is your insurance policy to uh, you know rent a car and get out of there in a hurry, and all your assets are frozen, that's a problem. Or if your assets are identified, that's a problem. So Bitcoin is kind of private banking for similar reasons, for privacy and financial affairs, but uh, with a lower barrier to entry. Yeah. But these, you know, I think it's always worth having at least some of your coins that have no link to real name, like you bought it in cash, in person, or something like that. So you know, that's one thing. And then about the centralization forces, you know, I'm, I'm somebody, you know, I guess a lot of people here have used exchanges that's like relatively active trader. And what you, what you figure out is that um, it, whether to use an exchange or not is a balance between your trust in the exchange, you know, where are they incorporated, what governments are they vulnerable to, are the operators like reasonably respected and trustable if they've been around for a while, but also, you know, what's the liquidity on the exchange? In other words, you know, when the price is moving rapidly, do they keep a good price or do they flash crash? Mm -hmm. Because if they flash crash, you never want to trade on an exchange because you could get liquidated falsely, right, or miss a trade. Um, and so, you know, any any kind of decision is is there enough liquidity to work? And so, you know, it tends to, liquidity draws liquidity, as Obi said. So people will tend to go to the place with more liquidity. So it sort of tends to concentrate a bit. That's the problem. And these kind of meta services are trying to pull liquidity, mm. like uh, Fireblocks and things like that. And BitGo, part of the story was they could sort of share liquidity by exchanges because they could provide features to power users and market makers to move funds very quickly between any participating exchanges. Okay. So you kind of get a sort of virtual combined big exchange. All these things are like centralizing, and it's just, it's just the user demand. They want liquidity. Uh, they want no flash crashes. And so they'll gravitate to things with liquidity. And they won't always understand, or they'll slowly forget about the custody risks, or you know, where this exchange is incorporated, or the history of it. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to take the last piece of advice there. Um, have some no KYC Bitcoin. I think that was what you were saying at the, yeah. was the, uh, the style to your point. Could I ask you for one piece, one quick piece of advice, Obi, in the same to Shimon, and then we'll wrap up for the, for the break. Um, try to um, be open to ways of self custody. It will become more and more important as the coming months and years go by. Great. And Shimon? Yeah, same here. And also, uh, look at which jurisdiction you uh, park your wealth at, because um, you know, that mm. probably bad things are coming at some point. Risk happens fast, doesn't it, as Greg Foss says. Okay, can I get a round of applause for this amazing panel? Adam Back, Obi Nwozu, and Shimon from OKX.